Why is the King's Dagger destined for greatness? And why does Rhaenyra remind us so much of Arya Stark? House of the Dragon is here. Here's what you missed in Episode 1. House of the Dragon takes place 172 years before the birth of Daenerys Targaryen and is a very faithful adaptation of George R. R. Martin's 2018 book Fire and Blood, according to showrunner Ryan Condal, beginning about halfway through its sweeping narrative. Part of the appeal of House of the Dragon is the chance to see King's Landing at a time of relative peace and prosperity. The Red Keep is brand new, and the Dragon Pit is in its heyday, with several adult specimens kept within its cavernous walls. Cyrax is growing quickly. It should soon be as large as Caraxes. This is the same Dragon Pit we see during Game of Thrones in utter ruin as Daenerys, Jon, and Tyrion reveal their captive white in an attempt to convince Cersei to join their fight against the White Walkers. The Dragon Pit Ruins are also where the series finale takes place, during which a newly formed council nominates their next ruler, putting the final nail in the coffin of the Dragon Riding family's domination. That their ruins in Game of Thrones, however, means the Dragon Pit fell into disrepair while the Targaryens still occupied the throne. Depending on how closely House of the Dragon hews to the books and how many seasons it runs, we may eventually get to see its demise play out in live action. Yeah, that's the iconic Iron Throne in House of the Dragon. It just looks a lot more like what George R. R. Martin originally had in mind than the Seat of Swords as it appeared in Game of Thrones. In the books, Martin describes the Iron Throne as ugly, asymmetrical, and huge, and the House of the Dragon version fits that description nicely. In his lore, it was made of the swords of 1,000 enemies vanquished by King Aegon and melted by his dragon, Balerion. As impressive and intimidating as the Iron Throne in Game of Thrones was, it wasn't a monstrosity that sprawled all over the throne room the way it does in House of the Dragon. There's another throne-related detail later in the episode that speaks to Martin's world-building. King Viserys has a nasty wound on his back that he attributes to the throne, and when we see him actually sitting in it, he cuts his hand on the armrest. Could that be a foreshadowing of some bad news to come? Rhaenyra clearly wants to lead, but she seems more interested in making her own history on the back of her dragon than she is in studying the history of those who came before her. Her friend and companion, Alicent Hightower, implores her to recite back the story of Princess Nymeria to please the Septa. At first, Rhaenyra bluffs her way through it, but when pressed, she effortlessly rattles off the bullet points. Nymeria, she says, fled her Valerian pursuers with 10,000 ships across the narrow sea arrived in Dorne and destroyed her own fleet to show her people they were finished running. She married Lord Mors Martell to unite Dorne under one flag for the first time. While few women inherited thrones on the mainland, Nymeria saw to it that lines of succession were gender blind. After her death, her daughter ruled. Nymeria, and perhaps her legend, may sound familiar to fans of Game of Thrones. Arya Stark named her direwolf Nymeria after the warrior queen. Nymeria? That House of the Dragon chose to highlight the tale of Nymeria is no accident. Her strength and ambition not only mirror Rhaenyra's, her husband also mirrors one of Rhaenyra's potential suitors. During the name day tournament, a victorious Kristen Cole reveals himself to be Dornish, which is surprising enough to elicit a reaction from the young women. Rhaenyra knowing her history brings to mind Sansa Stark, being quizzed by a Septa in Season 1 of Game of Thrones, and her correctly identifying the builder of two of King Landing's landmarks. Who built the Iron Throne? Aegon the Conqueror. And who built the Red Keep? Maegor the Cruel. Speaking of Maegor the Cruel, in the first episode of House of the Dragon when Otto Hightower brings up the issue of succession at the Small Council following the tragic deaths of the King's wife and day-old son, he warns that Prince Daemon should never sit on the Iron Throne. Daemon would be a second Maegor, or worse. He is impulsive and violent. Only one episode in, it's painfully clear that the Hand of the King and the Prince are bitter rivals, so his input should be taken with a grain of salt. So, who was Maegor the Cruel? He's only briefly mentioned in the Game of Thrones TV series, but we learned he built the Red Keep and used wildfire against his enemies. The books tell us he was the second son of Aegon the Conqueror and the third Targaryen King of Westeros. He came to power after the death of his weaker older brother, who tried to co-rule alongside him. He murdered his own nephew to prevent his claim to the throne, 
After the Red Keep was finished, Magor had all the workers killed to preserve the secrets of its blueprints. By the end of his six tyrannical years in power, he'd managed to unite almost the entire realm against him. Damon is an opportunistic and violent womanizer, but it remains to be seen if he can live up to Magor's deranged awfulness. Princess Rhaenyra is frustrated by her father's obsession with producing a male successor and she seems ambivalent at best about her future as a wife and mother. She laments that no matter what she does, she'll never be a son and when a son is imminent, Alicent asks if she's worried about her position. She says no, but it's obvious the real answer is yes. So when Viserys summons her to tell her he's decided to name her his heir, she's genuinely taken aback. The king even apologizes to her for wasting many years wanting for a son when she was already worthy of the crown. Viserys warns her that the Iron Throne is the most dangerous seat in the Seven Kingdoms before he holds a ceremony to officially deem her Princess of Dragonstone, during which the lords bend the knee. In both Fire and Blood and House of the Dragon, Rhaenyra serves as cupbearer for the King's Small Council. This position might seem like a task that would be given to an intern, but it's actually a place of honor and a show of trust that's bestowed upon noble boys and girls. It's more explicit in the book, but by keeping Rhaenyra around him as he conducts his business, Viserys is exposing her to what's essentially classified information as well as to the daily goings-on of a monarch. A disguised Arya Stark, in another parallel to Rhaenyra, served as Tywin Lannister's cupbearer on the show, not in the novels, because he recognized that she was highborn and enjoyed her wit. The gigantic skull of Beleriand is no small detail, but its significance and previous appearances may have been lost on some audiences. The dragon that belonged to Aegon the Conqueror, Magor the Cruel, and finally Viserys himself, Beleriand the Black Dread was the largest dragon in the post-conquest era and, as Viserys explains, the last living thing to flee Valyria before the doom. The king asks his daughter what she sees when she looks upon his remains. Rhaenyra answers that she sees them, the Targaryens. She grasps that their family has exercised influence over the kingdoms because they can control the fearsome beasts, but their fortunes rise and fall with the creatures to whom they've tethered their destiny. Viserys sees that they're as wonderful as they are terrible and doubts that his people should have ever tried to tame them. There are power men should never have trifled with. Readers of the books and Game of Thrones viewers may recognize this imposing skull, which would put any natural history museum display to shame. Among other instances, Cersei plots her attack on Daenerys' dragons from Beleriand's crypt, and the skull can be seen behind Tyrion as he plans the Dragon Pit Summit with Jaime Lannister. In other words, for all the destruction that's befallen King's Landing and the Seven Kingdoms at large over the past two centuries, the remains of the Black Dread still rest in peace, if a little worse for wear. In the final moments of the House of the Dragon premiere, King Viserys makes sure that his daughter, Princess Rhaenyra, understands just how precarious and loaded with responsibility her role as queen will be. He describes Aegon the Conqueror's vision, in which a coming cataclysm will begin with a long, harsh winter and bring with it a threat from the north like the world has never seen. He tells her that for the Seven Kingdoms to survive, a Targaryen must remain on the throne, presumably to fight the Dark Force with their dragons. At this point, he reveals the Valyrian steel blade at his hip. While all Valyrian steel can kill White Walkers, the threat to which King Viserys was referring, this isn't just any Valyrian steel dagger. It's THE Valyrian steel dagger. A would-be assassin uses it to try to murder Bran Stark in Game of Thrones. When he just barely fails, the weapon ends up in the Stark's possession and it follows them throughout the show. Catelyn takes it to King's Landing to try and solve the plot against her family. Its ownership, however, remains a mystery. It could have been Littlefinger's or Tyrion's. The former says he lost it to the latter in a bet. Bran eventually gives it to Arya, who famously wields it in the battle for Winterfell to finish off the Night King, about whom Aegon's dream warned him. It's she who holds it still, as far as we know. But nearly two centuries earlier, it was the property of King Viserys.